Welcome to This Week in Hastings Headline History, where we take a look back at what was making news in Hastings and St. Johns County, Florida, over a century ago. In this podcast, I'll share stories directly out of the pages of the Hastings Herald, which was published weekly in the early 1900s. So let's go back in time for some of the top news stories from this week in 1920. Old potato crops well cleaned up, spud prices continue high. Letters which are arriving almost daily from the northern markets continue to indicate that the old potato crop is much more nearly cleaned up than had been estimated as the result of earlier reports. Apparently, the local crop of new potatoes is a fair way to a nearly clear field when it's put out on the market. What prices will be when the local crop moves is, of course, impossible to predict at present, but every indication seems to point toward prices that will be unusually high and that will tend to make up for whatever shortage may be found in the local yield. On the heels of Monday's report to the effect the first carload of Florida's potatoes sold in Pittsburgh for $18 and $20 comes the following telegram from Philadelphia. Small shipment of Florida rose sold $19 to $20. The telegram was sent by a company of Philadelphia produce dealers arriving here Wednesday morning, indicating as it does in conjunction with other reports the unprecedented strength of the opening market. It has caused a marked increase in the local optimism, which was already soaring high. Labor Bureau is becoming active. The Hastings Farm Bureau is preparing for its annual drive into the surrounding county for the purpose of bringing laborers to Hastings during the approaching potato season. To enable it to conduct its mission, the Bureau is issuing a call for contributions from local farmers, who will be aided by its efforts, which calls attention to the fact that the season is close at hand, and money for conducting the Bureau's work should be forthcoming immediately. It's been customary in the past for each farmer in the Hastings District to contribute 10 cents for each acre planted of potatoes, and contributions figured at that rate are requested for this year. Attention is called particularly to the fact that this year labor is even more scarce than usual. Thus, as it will be necessary for the crop to be harvested in the usual space of time, Unusual efforts will be necessary to bring the required number of laborers here, and the work of recruiting them must be started without delay. Labor agitator is jailed. County is $300 richer for arrests. As a result of the activities of Judge H.F. Moore and Marshal Chazzy Green, the county was enriched on Wednesday last by the neat little sum of $300, all donated at the instigation of Judge Moore by visitors in Hastings. Henry Scott, alleged to be a labor agitator and said to have spent several days in Hastings in an endeavor to persuade local laborers to strike for increased wages, was arrested on Wednesday morning charged with vagrancy and disturbing labor. On being searched, he was found to be in possession of a neat little toothpick in the form of a dirk 10 inches long and as sharp as a razor. The dirk was confiscated and Henry was charged $100 and costs which he paid indicating that the calling of labor agitator cannot be without its pecuniary rewards. Robert Jackson of Jacksonville wandered into Hastings, toting a six-gun, which brought him into contact with Marshall Green. Judge Moore invited Robert to contribute $100 and costs toward the support of the county, and the invitation was accepted. Mary Pope, alleged to have come here from Jacksonville for the purpose of enticing labor away, was arrested on that charge and added $20 and costs to the expense of the account of her local trip. And Anderson Pope, discovered in company with a nice wiggly little copper pipe, was charged with having in his possession a copper coil for use in making unlawful intoxicants, and he contributed his coil, wrapped in a $5 bill, to the county. New mayor and town council again elected and have been sworn in. With the largest vote polled at any of the several recent town elections, the new mayor and town council of Hastings were elected Tuesday and were sworn into office Tuesday evening. The new government consists of the same men who were formally elected to office, with the exception of G.W. Waller, who was defeated by F.L. Brown by a majority of four votes. This week's newspaper also includes a letter from the new mayor. It reads... I will take this means to thank the people of Hastings for the confidence they have in me, as expressed by the unanimous election of me to the office of mayor. We have one of the best farming districts in the state, and our community is filled with good and respectable people. So why should we not have a more beautiful and inviting town and community? A person is helpless without friends, their aid and assistance. So 
I hope I will have the aid and assistance of Hall Hastings people in the discharge of my duties. I would love to see our town with more sidewalks, shade trees, and with the streets clean and beautiful, which can be done easily if we all want it, and I believe we do. Let's drive towards this end and make Hastings one of many beautiful towns in Florida. I will, as far as I'm concerned, do all in my power to have a better Hastings in every respect, and I ask for the cooperation of everyone, both town and community. Signed, Dr. B.L. Paget. Demonstrates Digger. M.H. Daints, representing the Champion Digger, made in Hammond, Indiana, is making his headquarters in the J.B. Hughes store while he will remain during potato season. One of the diggers on exhibition outside the store is attracting considerable interest among local potato growers because of a change in its construction. The new digger is equipped with a roller instead of trucks in front, which permits digging potatoes without damaging corn planted at the side of the beds. Still no winning potato. We see that the $5 offer of the Hastings Herald for the first 1920 number one potato weighing a half pound or more, and we feel sure that this class of tater is right out here in this community and will be shortly conveyed to the Hastings Herald. If you're wondering what people were doing for entertainment this week in 1920, this article tells us what was happening at the Cobfield Grand. Raymar the Mystic, who has changed his name since appearing in St. Augustine, where he was billed as Waymar, will be the feature attraction throughout the entire week. As a mystic, possessor of second sight, mind reader, or whatever persons of such capabilities may be called, Raymar seems to stand in a class by himself. Regardless of whether his talents are exhibited as the result of tricks or some actual additional sense, the results he has achieved, judged by his appearances in St. Augustine, are little short of marvelous. The usual program of feature and comedy films will be exhibited at each performance without being in any way cut down or shortened because of the added attraction. Now on to this week's Talk of the Times, where we take a look back at what people were talking about in town. This week, people in Hastings were asking if there was an arsonist among them. It's titled, A Serious Question, and it reads, Is there a firebug at work in Hastings? That question has been frequently raised by local citizens since the fire last Sunday, which destroyed the Dixie Highway garage and which was unquestionably of incendiary origin. Furthermore, features surrounding the other fires which have occurred in this town recently seem to point to a strong suspicion that an individual suffering from some form of the dementia, which finds an outlet in insane areas, is operating in this vicinity. The destruction of the Epps barn a fortnight ago is said to have resulted from a fire, which had many suspicious indications in the first place. Nobody had visited the barn so far as is known for some time previous to the fire. Certainly, nobody carrying any form of fire which might have been transferred to the building. The cause of the auditorium fire has never been explained beyond theory and guesswork. That fire started in a part of the building that was visited rarely and where no excuse existed for any person going at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. There are numerous places in any pigeon loft where the fire originated or a lighted candle might be left to burn down until it started a fire. But can it be that some of that sort was done in this case? The persistence with which the garage was fired Sunday is particularly worthy of note. When the first, about 3 o'clock in the morning, was discovered and extinguished before it accomplished any damage, a second one occurred 12 hours later. That building was unquestionably marked for destruction, and whoever was responsible for the occurrence refused to rest until his purpose had been accomplished. The middle of February, four buildings had been destroyed by fires of peculiar origin. In view of that fact, and of the peculiar circumstances which have surrounded all of the fires, it might well behoove local people to keep especially watchful eye on their property until the firebug has been apprehended or his existence disproved. I hope you enjoyed this week's edition of Hastings Headline History. This podcast was brought to you by Presenting the Past, bringing history back to the present through historic presentations and the sale of treasures from days gone by. This episode was written and produced by me, Michelle Morello, with the aid of vintage copies of the Hastings Herald. Now it's time for this week's musical memory when we listen back to a song that everyone was listening to a hundred years ago. 
This week's number is an upbeat little ditty that was written in 1918, but it really picked up steam in popular culture when Ted Weems and his orchestra recorded it. That wasn't too surprising, because Weems had a knack of taking something and making it much bigger than how it started. That even went back to his youth. When Weems was in school, he wanted to organize a band. His teacher encouraged him, saying he would pay him and the band members a penny apiece if they would perform each time there was a fire drill. So Ted recruited other kids to be in the band, but didn't give them the penny. Instead, he charged them each a penny to take part, and Ted saved all those pennies to purchase newer and better instruments for the band. Then in college, Ted and his brother started a band only allowing the best musicians they could find to play with them. And soon, they were making music all over the country, all the way to the top, being invited to play at the inaugural ball of President Warren G. Harding in 1921. This week's song was recorded in 1923 by Weems and his orchestra, and by 1924, it had made its way all the way up the charts to number one, where it sat for five weeks. It was the band's first number one hit, selling over one million copies. Here's that song, Somebody Stole My Gal, recorded by Ted Weems and his orchestra. <laughs> 